The lighthouse keeper. The island was moving all night. The fisherman's point drifted imperceptibly a little further out to sea. Shudder after shudder shook the whole island like chills running up and down its spine and the black pool seemed to creep deeper and deeper into the rocks. It was sucked in and out and fresh waves broke in from the sea but the pool never seemed to fill up. Its enormous mirror-like black eye sank lower and lower, surrounded by a fringe of seagrass round the edges. On the beach, on the leeward side, little field mice ran backwards and forwards at the edge of the water, the sand slipping away from under their paws. Boulders turned over heavily, revealing the pale roots of the sea pinks. At dawn, the island slept. The trees had reached the lighthouse rock, Deep holes were left where great boulders had been before, now lying scattered among the heather. They were waiting for another night to come so that they could roll nearer and nearer the lighthouse. The great autumn gale continued to blow. At seven o'clock, Moomin Papa went out to look at the boat. The water had risen again and the southwest wind was blowing the sea higher and higher. He found the fisherman lying rolled up at the bottom of the adventure. He was playing with a handful of pebbles. He blinked under his fringe, but he said nothing. And the adventure lay there, beaten by the waves and without mooring. Can't you see that this boat is about to drift out to sea? said Moomin Papa. She's being bashed against the stone. Just look at it. Come on now. Jump out and give me a hand to pull her up. The fisherman twisted his bent legs over the side of the boat and tumbled onto the beach. His eyes were just as kind and as gentle as ever, and he said, I haven't done any harm. You haven't done any good either, said Moomin Papa. With a tremendous effort, he pulled the boat up himself. He sat down on the sand, puffing and blowing. What was left of the sand, that is. The angry sea seemed to be jealous of the sand, taking more and more away of it every night. He looked at the fisherman sourly and said, Did you find the coffer? But the fisherman only smiled. There's something wrong with you and I can't make it out, Moomin Papa said to himself. You're not a human being at all. You're more like a plant or a shadow, just as if you'd never been born. I was born, the fisherman said immediately. It's my birthday tomorrow. Moomin Papa was so surprised that he began to laugh. You remember that all right, he said. So you have a birthday, do you? Just think, and how old are you, if I may ask? But the fisherman turned his back and strolled off along the beach. Moomin Papa went back to the lighthouse. He felt very worried about his island. The ground where the forest had been was abandoned and full of deep holes. Long furrows crossed the heather left by the trees as they moved towards the lighthouse rock. And there they stood, a tangled skein of fright. I wonder what one has to do to calm an island down, Moomin Papa wondered. It won't do for the island and the sea to fall out with each other. They must be friends. Moomin Papa stood still. There was something wrong with the lighthouse rock. With a very slight movement, it was shrinking, like skin going into wrinkles. A couple of grey boulders turned over in the heather. The island seemed to be waking up. Moomin Papa listened. A chill went down his spine. He was sure he could feel it, a very slight thumping sound. He could feel it all over his body getting closer. 
It seemed to come from deep down in the ground. Moomin and Papa lay down in the heather and pressed his ear to the ground. He could hear the island's heart beating. It was deeper than the sound of the breakers. Deep, deep down in the earth, a soft, dull heartbeat. The island is alive, Moomin and Papa thought. My island is just as much alive as the trees and the sea. Everything is alive. He got up slowly. A juniper was creeping quietly through the heather like an undulating green carpet. Moomin Papa scrambled out of its way and stood stock still, frozen on the spot. He could see the island moving, a living thing crouching on the bottom of the sea, helpless with fear. Fear is a terrible thing, Moomin Papa thought. It can come suddenly and take hold of everything. But who will protect all the little creatures who come in its way? Moomin and Papa started to run. He got home and hung his hat on its nail. What's the matter? asked Moomin Mama. Has the boat? I pulled her up, said Moomin Papa. And the family stared at him and he added, It's a fisherman's birthday tomorrow. No, really? Moomin Papa exclaimed. Is that why you're looking so strange? Well, we must give a party for him. Imagine, even the fisherman has a birthday. It'll be easy to think of a present for him, said Little Mai. Little parcels full of seagrass, lumps of moss, or just a damp spot, perhaps. Now you're not being very nice, Moomin Papa said. But I'm not nice, cried Little Mai. Moomin Mama stood at the window, looking out of the island. He could hear his family discussing two very important questions. How to get the fishermen to come into the lighthouse and how to get the crate of whisker over the sea wash point. But he could only think of the island's timid heartbeats deep down in the ground. He would have to talk to the sea about it. Mum and Papa went and sat on the lighthouse keeper's ledge in the cliff looking as though he was the figurehead in the bows of his galleon, the island. This was the real storm he had waited for, but it wasn't what he had imagined it would be. No beautiful pearls of foam on the waves, no, not in a wind force eight. Instead, the foam was blown off the surface of the sea like angry grey smoke, and the water was lined and furrowed like a face wrinkled with rage. Suddenly, in the way it can happen to a troll, Mim and Papa found it terribly easy to start talking to the sea. Silently, of course. You're much too grown up to show off like this. It's unworthy of you. Is it really so important to you to frighten a poor little island like this? It has a tough enough time right out here as it is. You ought to be happy that it's here. What fun would you have without its rocks to wash your breakers over? Think carefully now. Here's a little tuft of trees growing all bent for your sake and a handful of scanty soil which you do your best to wash away and the few rugged rocks which you polish so smooth that there's hardly anything left of them. And then you've the nerve to frighten them? Moom and Papa leaned forward and stared sternly at the fuming sea. There's something you don't seem to understand, he said. It's your job to look after this island. You should protect and comfort it instead of behaving as you do. Do you understand? Moom and Papa listened, but the sea made no answer. You've tried it on with us too, he said. You've pestered us in every way you can, but it hasn't worked. We're getting along somehow, in spite of you. I've learned to understand you, and that's what you don't like, do you? And we haven't given up, have we? By the way, Moom and Papa continued, to be perfectly fair, it was jolly decent of you to give us that crate of whiskey. I know why you did. You know when you're beaten, don't you? But to get your own back by taking it out of the island was a pretty it was a petty thing to do. Now I'm only saying this because, well, because I like you. Mim and Papa was silent. He felt tired and leaned back against the cliff and waited. The sea said nothing, but a large shiny plank of wood was drifting towards the shore, bobbing up and down on the waves. Mim and Papa regarded it excitedly. There was another one, and another, and another. Someone had thrown a whole boatload of them overboard. He climbed up the cliff and started to run, laughing to himself. The sea was saying it was sorry. It wanted them to stay. It wanted to help them to go on building on the island. 
He wanted them to settle down there and enjoy themselves, although they were surrounded by a vast, never-changing horizon closing in on them. Come outside, all of you, he shouted up the winding staircase. Driftwood, lots of it. Come and help me to salvage it. The whole family came tumbling out. The planks drifted towards the leeward side of the island, carried along by the heaving swell. Sorry, for a second. My horse has come to see what's going on. In no time at all, they would drift on past the island. They would have to be quick. They threw themselves into the sea, unconscious of the cold water. Perhaps they had some pirate blood in their veins that made them plunge in like that. The spirit of some ancestor... Sorry, the spirit of some ancestor out for ill-gotten gains seemed to possess them. They seemed to be throwing off the melancholy of the island and the loneliness of the sea as they went in and out of the water, carrying and stacking the planks and shouting to each other over the roar of the waves. The sky above them was still sparkling and cloudless. It's an exciting job trying to manoeuvre a two-inch plank ashore. It's unmanageable and heavy with water and can so easily get away and then hit you with the force of a battering ram when it is carried in by the next wave. Then it is really dangerous. And when it is lying on the beach out of the sea's reach, it becomes treasure trove. Shining and with the warm colour of old tar, it lies at your feet and you can read the owner's mark at one end. With the proud satisfaction of the conqueror, you begin to think of three inch nails and the sound of them being hammered in. The wind must be at least force nine now, cried Moom and Papa. He took a deep breath and looked at the sea. Good, he said. Now we're even. When all the planks were piled up on the beach, the family went home to make some fish soup. Like a living force, the storm continued to rage on, and little Maya could only just keep on her feet. Moom and Mama stopped when she came to her garden, now hidden under a mass of branches. She got down on her knees and looked underneath them. Is the apple tree coming up? Moom and Troll asked. I'm not quite as stupid as all that, said Moom and Mama with a laugh. I just thought it needed a little encouragement, that's all. She looked at her withered rose bushes and thought, how silly of me to put them there. But there are plenty, the island is full of them, and anyway, wildflowers are even more beautiful than garden flowers, perhaps. Mummy and Papa had dragged a few planks up the stairs and got out his toolbox. I know wood shrinks when it dries, he said, but I can't wait. You don't mind if there are a few cracks in the kitchen shelves, do you? Not at all, said the Mummy and Mama. Go ahead, hammer away while you feel like it. She had painted nothing that day. Instead, she had made a few little sticks to support the flowers and tidied up the desk. She had even tidied up the lighthouse keeper's drawer. Mummy Troll was sitting at the table drawing. He knew exactly what his little house should look like. There wasn't a great deal left of the indelible pencil, but somehow he felt sure that the sea would wash one ashore when needed. They could hear the sea thundering rhythmically round the island and the sky was as white as if it had been newly washed. Little Mai had fallen asleep on the stove. Mummy and Mama gave them a quick look and walked over to her mural. She pressed her paws against the trunk of the apple tree. Nothing happened. It was only a wall, just an ordinary plaster wall. I just wanted to know, thought Mummy and Mama. I was right. Of course I can't get into this garden anymore. I'm not homesick now. At dusk, Mummy Troll went to feed it the hurricane lamp. The gap of an operating was underneath the stairs with a pay from the thorny sneak. He put a thing under the hole in the top and thought of the stropper. When he left, the gun is eroded, making a strange echoing sound. He head in the over the thing and waited. He shot the gun. The heat put it down and the stone is turning on the floor for a moment. There was no more perfume. It was finished. The lamp had been burning every night in the room at first, 
and every night in the house shone from the groggy. Apart from the little man, he brought severe pain over the ears. What he had to do, what would the groggy say? He dared think what this pain she would be. He stood on the stair with the nose in the face. He left and thought what had he done. Are you absolutely certain the whole can's empty? Mummy Mama asked, giving the lamp a good shake. They had finished their tea and the windows were getting dark. Quite empty, said Mummy Tro wretchedly. It must be leaking, said Mummy Papa. Perhaps it's getting rusty. It's impossible that we've used all that paraffin. Mummy Mama sighed. Now we shall have to manage with the light of the fire in the stove, she said. There are only three candles left, and I must put them on the fisherman's birthday cake. She put some more wood on the fire and left the door of the stove open. The fire cracked cheerfully, and the family put the boxes in a small semicircle round it. From time to time, the stone whistled in the chimney. It was a lonely, melancholy sound. I wonder what's happening outside, said Mummy Mama. I can't tell you, Mummy Papa answered. The island is going to bed. I can assure you that it's going to bed and we'll go to sleep at about the same time as we do. Mummy Mama laughed a little. Then she said thoughtfully, Do you know, all the this, all this time we've been living here like this, I've had a feeling that we're on an expedition somewhere. Everything is so different all the time, as if it was Sunday every day. I'm beginning to wonder whether it's a good feeling after all. The others waited for her to go on. Of course, we can't always be in an expedition. It has to come to an end sometime. I'm terribly afraid that it will suddenly feel like Monday again, and then I shan't be able to feel that any of this has been real. She was silent, and looked at Mumu and Papa a little hesitatingly. But of course it's real, said Mumu and Papa amazed, and it's fine to feel that it's always Sunday. It's just that feeling that we had lost. What are you talking about? asked little Mai. Mumitro stretched his legs. He had a feeling too all over. He could only think of the groke. I think I'll go I think I'll go outside for a while, he said. The others looked at him. I want a breath of fresh air, he said impatiently. I can sit here stewing any longer. I need some exercise. Now listen, Mumi Papa began, but Mumi Mama said all right, go outside if you feel like it. What's come over him? asked Mummy and Papa when Mummy and Troll had gone. It's growing pains, said Mummy Mama. He doesn't understand what's wrong with him either. He never seemed to realize he's growing up. He seemed to think he's still a little boy. Of course he's still quite small. Of course he's still quite small said Mumi and Papa somewhat surprised. Mumi Mama laughed and poked the fire. It was really much nicer than candlelight. The groke sat waiting on the beach. Mumi Cho came towards her without the hurricane lamp. He stopped by the boat and looked at her. There was nothing he could do for her. He could hear the beating of the highlands heart and the sound of the stones and the trees moving slowly away from the sea. There was nothing he could do to stop it. Suddenly the girl started to sing, her skirts flutter as she swayed to and fro, stumping on the sand and doing her best to show him that she was pleased to see him. Mumin Cho moved for words in amazement. There was no doubt about it, the girl was pleased to see him. She didn't mind the hurricane lamp. She was delighted that he had come to meet her. She stood quite still until she had finished her dance. Then he watched her shuffle off, shuffle off down the beach and disappear. He went to felt the sand where she had stood. It wasn't frozen hard at all, but felt the same as it always did. He listened carefully, but all he could hear 
with the breakers. It was as if the island had suddenly fallen asleep. He went back home. The others were already in bed, and there were only a few glowing embers in the stove. He crept into bed and curled up. What did she say? asked little Mai. She was pleased, Gumucho whispered back. She didn't notice any difference. On the fisherman's birthday, the sky was just as clear and the storm was blowing just as hard. Wake up, said Mumi and Papa. Everything's all right again. And your mama stuck her nose out from under the blankets. I know, she said. No, you don't, cried Mumi and Papa proudly. The island's calmed down. It's not afraid anymore. The bushes have come back to their proper places. And the trees will too as soon as they can. Well, what do you say to that? Oh, how wonderful, said Mumi and Mama sitting up. It would have been very difficult to have a proper birthday party with lots of trees getting in the way all the time. Think of the dirt they would have brought in with them too. She thought for a moment and then added, I wonder whether they would go back to, to just the same places or choose new ones instead. Let me know when they make up their minds and I go and put seaweeds around the roots. You're a dreary lot, played little Mai. She was staring out of the window, looking very disappointed. Everything going to be the same as it always was. I was sure the island would sink, or float away or take off into the air. Nothing ever really happens round here. She looked reproach reproachfully at Moomintro. He laughed. Yes, he said. It isn't everybody who can put a whole forest back where it belongs. You're right exclaimed Mumi and Papa with delight. Not everybody can do that, and without boasting about it afterwards, too. I must say some people are in a cracking good mood this morning, said little Mai. It would be better if they look after the crates of whiskey. Mumi and Papa Mumito ran to the window. The crate was still there on the point, but the point had moved quite a way out of sea. I can do without breakfast, said Moomin Papa, putting his hat on. I must go down and see how high the water is. Have a look for the fisherman while you are about it, said Moomin Mama. It will be just as well to invite him in a good time. Yes, do, shouted little Mai. Imagine, he might have another engagement this evening. But the, fishers, but the fisherman had disappeared. Perhaps he was hiding in the, in the ticket, thicket. Sitting inside all by himself, thinking, It's my birthday today. The cake was finished and stood waiting on the table with the candles. They had hung up branches of mountain ash and juniper, and little Molly had picked a bunch of it. Why are you so quiet? she asked. I was thinking, answered Moomin Troll. He was putting a ring of tiny pebbles round the cake. What do you do to get her warm? asked little Mai. I went out during the night and sand wasn't frozen at all. What do you mean? said Moomin Troll. Then he blushed. You mustn't let on. What sort of telltale do you think I am? asked little Mai. I don't care a fig for other people's secrets. And I certainly don't broadcast them all, all over the place. Anyway, they all come out sooner or later. Believe you me, this island has a lot of secrets, and I know them all. She laughed mockingly and rushed off. Moo and Papa came puffing up the stairs with a load of wood. Mama has no idea how to use the axe, he said. But she can saw, all right. I must make enough room around the wood pile for us to work there together. He flung the wood down by the stove and asked, Do you think I could give the old the fisherman my old top hat? I shan't want to wear it again. Yes, do. You've got the one the lighthouse keeper left behind, said Moom and Troll. Moom and Papa nodded and went up the ladder to look for some paper to make a parcel. He was lifting the lid of a box when he caught sight of another verse of poetry on the wall. He hadn't seen this one before. He read the lighthouse keeper's forlorn spidery handwriting. It's the 3rd of October, and nobody knows. Soon my birthday's quite over. 
the Southwester Blows. But it's the 3rd of October today, thought Moo and Papa with amazement. It was the Lighthouse Keeper's birthday today too. What a coincidence. He found some paper and then climbed down the ladder. The others were discussing on how they could get the fisherman into the lighthouse. He'll never come, said Little Mai. He's afraid of the lighthouse. He always makes elaborate detours to avoid going past it. Isn't there something that would tempt him? Suggested Moomin Troll. Something pretty, perhaps. Should we try singing to him? Oh, dry up, said Little Mai. That would scare him off. Moo and Mama got up and walked firmly towards the door. There is only one way, she said. I shall go and ask the poor creature myself in the proper old-fashioned way. And little Mai can go and pull him out of the thicket. When they got there, the fisherman was sitting on the edge of the thicket with a sprig of flowering thyme in his hair. He got up and stared at them, waiting for them to say something. Many happy returns of the day said Moomin Mama kept seeing. The fisherman bowed his head with great solemnity. You're the first person who's ever remembered my birthday, he said. I feel very honoured. We are having a little party for you at home, Moomin Mama went on. In the lighthouse, asked the fisherman, screwing up his face. I'm not coming there. Now, listen to me, said Moomin Mama quietly. There's no need for you to look at the lighthouse at all. Just shut your eyes tight and give me your hand. My, run and put the coffee on and light the candles, please, dear. The fisherman shut his eyes and held out his hand. Moomin Mama took it and led him very carefully through the heather and up to the lighthouse rock. Now you must take a big step, she said. Yes, I know, answered the fisherman. When the door creaked, he stopped and wouldn't go on. There's a cake, and we've decorated the room, said Moomin Mama, and there are presents too. She got him over the threshold, and they started to climb the stairs. The wind moaned round the walls outside, and now and then one of the windows rattled. Moomin Mama could feel the fisherman's hand trembling. There's nothing to be afraid of, she said. It's not as bad as it sounds. We shall soon be there. She opened the door of the room and said, now you can open your eyes. The fisherman looked cautiously round. The candles were alight, although it wasn't yet twilight. The table looked very nice, with a clean white tablecloth and little green springs at the corners. The family stood in a line waiting for him. The fisherman looked at the cake. There were only three candles left, Mimi and Mama said apologetically. How old are you, if I may ask? I don't remember, the fisherman muttered. His eyes moved anxiously from one window to the other, up to the trap door. Many happy returns of the day, said Moomin and Papa. Pray be seated. But the fisherman remained standing and started to make for the door. Suddenly, little Mai yelled at the top of her voice, Sit down and behave yourself, she shouted angrily. The fisherman was so startled that he came up to the table and sat down. Before he knew what was happening, Moomin Mama had poured the coffee and one of the others undid the parcel with a hat in it and put it on his tangled head. He sat very still, trying to look at the hat from underneath. He wouldn't have any coffee. Try a little seagrass, suggested little Mai, giving him one of the presents done up in red leaves. You can eat that yourself, said the fisherman politely, and the whole family laughed. It was funny to hear him say something so apt. The party was immediately more relaxed, and they went on talking easily among themselves and led him to himself for a while. After a while, he took a sip of coffee. He pulled a wry face and took eight lumps of sugar, and he swallowed the whole lot at one go. Then he opened Moomintraw's present. The parcel was full of things Moomintroll had left on the beach for the seahorses. Little bits of glass, pebbles and four copper weights. The fisherman looked at the weights for a while and said, Huh. Then he opened the last little parcel and took out the shell with the inscription, A present from the seaside on it, and said, Huh. That's the best of the lot, said Moomintroll. 
it was washed up on the beach. Was it really? said the fisherman, looking at the bottom drawer of the desk. He got up and slowly went to the desk. The family watched him with interest. They were very surprised that he hadn't thanked them for their presence. It was getting dark, only a small patch of sunlight with, from the setting, sto setting sun shone on the apple tree on the wall. The three candles were burning steadily. The fisherman caught sight of the bird's nest on the desk. That should be in the chimney, he said firmly. It's been there for years. We had thought we might hang it out of the window, said Mimi Mama apologetically, but we haven't got round to do it. The fisherman stood in front of the desk, looking in the mirror. He stared at Mumin's papa's hat and contemplated his own unfamiliar face. Then his eyes turned to the jigsaw puzzle. He picked up a piece and fitted it immediately. With short, sharp movements, went on putting pieces in while the family got up and came and stood behind him to see what he was doing. He completed the puzzle. It was a picture of birds flying round the lighthouse. He turned round and looked at Moomin Papa. Now I remember, he said. We're both wearing the wrong hat. He took, the, he took off the hat he was wearing and offered it to Moomin Papa. They exchanged hats without saying a word to each other. The lighthouse keeper had come back. He buttoned up his corduroy jacket and hitched up the trousers. When he went and picked up his cup and said, I wonder if there's any more coffee. Mimi and Mama dashed to the stove. They all sat down at the table, but it was very difficult to find anything to say. The lighthouse keeper ate his piece of cake while the family looked at him a little shyly. I have painted a little on one of the walls, Mimi and Mama remarked defendantly. So I see, said the lighthouse keeper, a landscape. It makes a change, I suppose. It's well done, too. What have you thought to paint on the other wall? Maps, perhaps, said Moomin Mama. A map of the island, showing all the rocks and shallows and perhaps the depths of the water as well. My husband is very good at measuring the depths of the water. The lighthouse keeper nodded appreciatively. Moomin Papa felt very pleased but still couldn't bring himself to say anything. Little Mai's bright little eyes wandered from one to the other. She looked tremendously amused, and as though she was about to say something really unsuitable, but she didn't. Two of the candles had burned right down and run over the cake. It was dark and the storm was still raging outside, but inside it was quiet. They had seldom had such a peaceful evening. The thought of the grogue crossed Moomintrol's mind, but he didn't feel that he must think of her. He would see her later as usual, but he didn't have to. Somehow, he knew that he, she wasn't afraid of being disappointed any longer. At least, Moomin Papa said something. I have a crate of whiskey out there on the point. Do you think the wind will drop soon? When the southwesterly gale sets in, it can be weeks before it blows itself out. Your crate will be quite safe, don't worry, said the lighthousekeeper. I thought I might go and have a look at the weather in for a while, said Moomin Papa, filling his pipe. Do you think the boat's all right? Don't worry, said the lighthousekeeper. There's a new moon, so the water won't rise any higher. The third candle went out and only the glow of the fire shone over the floor. I've washed your sheets, said Mimi Mama, although they were quite clean. Your bed is in its old place. Thank you very much, the lighthouse keeper said, getting up from the table. I think I'll sleep up top tonight. They wished each other good night. Shall we go over to the point? asked Mimi Papa. Mimi Shaw nodded his head. Moomin Papa and Moomin Troll came out onto the lighthouse rock, new moons rising in the southeast, a little crescent moon, the beginning of a new month, a dark autumn month. They walked down towards the heather. Papa, 
said Moomin Troll. I've got something to do on the beach. I ought to meet someone there. All right, said Moomin Papa. See you tomorrow. So long. So long, said Moomin Troll. Moomin Papa walked on over the island. He wasn't thinking of the crate of whiskey or of the point particularly. What did one point matter? He had several of them. He came to the edge of the water and stood watching the breakers. There was the sea. His sea, going past, wave after wave, foaming recklessly, raging furiously, but somehow tranquil at the same time. All Moom and Papa's thoughts and speculations vanished. He felt completely alive from the tips of his ears to the tip of his tail. This was a moment to live to the full. When he turned to look at the island, his island, he saw a beam of light shining on the sea, moving out towards the horizon, and then coming back towards the shore in long, even waves. The lighthouse was working. Happy birthday, Lou. This is one of my horses, Kida. She's a little sweetheart, although she hates the flies, hence the fly mask on her. But she came over to say hello. But apparently she's not too interested in my reading, if that's anything to go by. Um, but I hope you have a wonderful day. I hope you enjoyed our little Moomin collaboration reading birthday fun.